hope that the next few days is going to be, are going to be an adventure for us in um, providing us with a, at least a little glimpse of how and why, actually, why and how this world civilization, this divine civilization is going to unfold gradually. And this is going to be relatively interactive and I will ask, hopefully, questions and I expect, you know, some answers and you will be awarded points and prizes for answers. <laughs> now, I think few thinking people would disagree with this statement of the Universal House of Justice. But the crucial need of the human race is to find a unifying vision of the nature of man and society and of the course, a common conviction of the course and direction of human history. And then the House of Justice goes on to say that because without such a common conviction, without such a vision, right, it is impossible, inconceivable, that we can actually lay the structures and the foundations of an increasingly interdependent world, of a global society, to which we are imperceptibly being forced. And this vision unfolds in the work and writings of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. So this is what we're going to share, share with you uh, over the next few days, and it's a very exciting and wonderful, enlightening vision. And the person, who's this? Yes, it's the little Shoghi Effendi, isn't it? Isn't he cute? <laughs> and Shoghi Effendi became, of course, was the, grand, uh, the grandson of Abdu'l Baha, thank you for clarifying that, and the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And it was really Shoghi Effendi who clarified and who unfolded the vision of what was in Baha'u'llah's writings for us in crystal clear language. Now, Shoghi Effendi was a very extraordinary person. Even when he was little, he was an intensely active child. And whenever in the holy household in Akka there was some mischief, something amiss going on, Within the children, Shoghi Effendi was always at the head of it. They knew it. He was the gang leader. Yes, very mischievous child. And he always used to pester Abdul Baha to write something for him. Because, of course, Abdul Baha was busy day and night writing thousands and thousands of letters right, to people all over the world who were asking him questions and who were, you know, wanting letters from him. So Abdul Baha was so busy writing all these, Shoghi Effendi kept pestering him, why don't you write one for me? Many times over. Eventually, Abdul Baha gave in and wrote him a tablet on the back of an envelope. <laughs> it, uh, this is the text of Abdul Baha's first message to Shoghi Effendi. Yeah. He is God. My Shoghi, I have no time to talk. Leave me alone. You said, write, I have written. What else should be done? Now is not the time for you to read and write. It is the time for jumping about and chanting, oh my God. Therefore, memorize the prayers of the Blessed Beauty and chant them that I may hear them because there is no time for anything else. Abdu'l-Baha Abbas. <laughs> so, it seems that when this wonderful gift reached this child, he set about memorizing several prayers and tablets in Baha'u'llah and he would sit for hours chanting them right at the top of his voice so that everybody, particularly Abdu'l-Baha, could hear him. So the whole, in the entire neighborhood could hear him, you see. So when his parents and other members of the family remonstrated with him, he said, look at this letter that I've got from, from Abdu'l-Baha. He said that uh, I should read and recite these verses so that Abdu'l-Baha could hear, hear me, and I am doing my very best. Finally, his parents begged Abdu'l-Baha to stop him. And Abdu'l-Baha simply told them to let Shoghi Effendi alone. So Shoghi Effendi, as I said, was an extraordinary person, the priceless pearl that had been given to this revelation, according to Abdu'l-Baha. And you find that Shoghi Effendi, as you see from this picture, when he's only, what, 10, 12 years old, he was intensely interested in learning, and particularly in history. And you find that this is a map that he drew when he was only about 12 or 13 years old of, what is this a map of? The Roman Empire, excellent. Who said Roman Empire? Yes, fantastic. Yeah, that's fine, well, that's good, excellent, of course. Fine, fine, you get two points. So this is very interesting as to why he was interested in the uh, Roman Empire and he was studying it so deeply. 
The most significant question with regard to the Roman Empire was why did it, this civilization, which was one of the greatest, the vastest and most glorious civilizations that we have ever seen in our world history, fell, declined and fell. This is the map of the Roman Empire, the bit in purple. And there are these striking parallels between the Rome of a century after Christ to the world of today that we're living in. What was the great, uh, just as a quick aside, what was the inspiration for the rise of the Roman Empire in any case? Conquering in itself, good point, but conquering in itself doesn't bring power. What actually enabled them to build such a wonderful civilization and to have a golden age and to spread? Yes, that was, that was the, the way in which the, the structures and so on were built. You're right, Anis? Laws, yes. Enormi. Okay, and where were they inspired from? The Senate. And where did these laws come from? Yes, what are you saying? Yes, the law. And where was the source of inspiration of the law? Yes, Katie. Sorry? Yeah, but before, yes. Yes, but who? Yes. Yes. May I give an answer? Yes, please. Yes. I think the most powerful element to create such an empire was, yeah. I think the most powerful thing was one unifying idea, yes. and this was Rome. Yes. They were united, even the slaves, yes. uh, everybody was happy because yes. they had the idea, they had the concept that they are doing something for a common goal. That's very good. Which was creating this Empire. Yes. And what was the uh, what was the source of inspiration for Rome coming into being, for the genesis of this? What what was the? I want to know the mechanism. Come on, you're Greeks, after all. It's a simple answer, actually. Huh? The Greek culture. You're absolutely right. That is the lady. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> yes, it was actually the Greeks. The Greek civilization, the Greek civilization was the great inspirer of the Rome. You can look at any encyclopedia or Wikipedia, if you like, or anywhere else, and it would tell you that it was the Greek culture and civilization. And these laws that came from Greece and the Plato's Republic and the philosophies of the great Greek philosophers, their visionary um, insights into the laws of civilization, in what, to, what really makes a democracy, what makes a country thrive and a civilization to thrive. And of course, the source of the inspiration of the Greek philosophers were, as you said, the teachings, and as Katie said, the teachings of the prophets of Israel, right, of Moses. Because at the time of the Greeks, the Greek philosophers, Judaism had reached its most glorious height during the days of Solomon and his son David. So there is increasing evidence emerging that these guys, like Socrates, Pythagoras, who's Pythagoras? You should know that, Anis. Pythagoras? Yes, that's right. He's one of the most important mathematicians whose theorem we still also learn in, <laughs> in school. Hippocrates, who was Hippocrates? The father of medicine. You know, he's my big boss, right? My boss and all these other guys, right? Your boss, Pythagoras, and uh, many of these others, Socrates, Empedocles, Balinus, all of these most important, famous um, Greek philosophers journeyed to Jerusalem and to the Holy Land and to the caves in, Ma in Haifa and Mount Carmel, and they sat at the feet of these Jewish doctors and scholars, and they learned and imbibed the basis of divine philosophy, the basis of teachings of the law, right? And they brought them back to Greece, and then they formulated all those philosophies that then made Greece famous and inf infused into it that spirit which uh, propelled Greece into the classical golden age. And there is increasing evidence provided by, for this, even in the writings of today from Eastern ancient histories. So that, um, so that the Greeks then, of course, so it was you lot, you know, it was your ancestors. <laughs> You're a very wonderful, great people. You have a very wonderful uh, ancestry. 
It was the, uh, as a result of the wonderful Greek civilization that the Roman uh, Empire was, uh, came into being, as was, it was inspired to build these amazing structures and so on. So, of course, the Romans, the Greek and the Romans developed this timeless architecture. So it is timeless architecture in that it is so beautiful from the thousands of years ago and even a th few, several thousand years, forever it'll be beautiful whenever and wherever they are built after this style. So that is what I mean by timeless style of architecture. And of course the Romans developed a very great infrastructure. These are some of the aqueducts that are still in use today. What are these? Oh, wow. These luxurious baths providing relaxation and therapy, mostly for the privileged Romans, of course. It's affluence, the richness and affluence, the wealth where the citizens lived in palaces surrounded by exquisite grounds. They had it all, didn't they, the Romans? Would you agree, Anis? Would you agree? They had it all, right? What's this one? They didn't have Wi-Fi. No, that's true. <laughs> they had other means of quite, quite rapid communication. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, what's this one? Do you know? Yeah, but what is that thing? It's a Roman coin. Fancy having coins like that, you know. Yeah. 10 cents, 50 cents. No. Right. So these beautifully crafted coins with Caesar's face all indicated the invincibility and its indestructibility of the great empire. The Romans, would, if, if they say the fall of Rome, never, never, that would be impossible. It's like saying the fall of the Coca-Cola and McDonald empire, never, never, that's impossible. The first question my daughter asked when she set foot in Rome airport, is there a McDonald's here? You know, that's right, forget about the culture and everything else, as long as there's a McDonald's. Not that I give her McDonald's every day by any chance, it's like two or three times a year at a, at a push. But still, <laughs> yeah. Okay, but yet Rome fell, right? All that's left of it is ruins for us to go and learn the lessons of history from. And there were some people who could actually s foresee and who could see the signs of impending decline and fall, such as Seneca and several of the other, Marcus Aurelius and several of the other thinkers. But generally, people tr denied it. They denied it. They were like blind to their immediate destiny. And the reason why we're actually discussing these, remember, is to draw parallels. You will yourself be able to draw parallels with what is happening today to realize that this system, in inverted commas, because it's really not a working system, that we are in the state that we're in today is doomed to fail. Therefore, on the ruins of this collapsing civilization, there has to be a new world civilization that will flourish. So that is why it's so important Shoghi Effendi asked us to, dis, to uh, study these. And there were, of course, several symptoms and signs that of the fall that were happening. So what are some of these symptoms and signs? of a declining civilization that the selfish emperors just ignored at their peril and blindly continued in their ways. Katie. No, I, in the Roman Empire? Okay, good, I didn't know that. Okay. Any other? Obvious signs and symptoms of a collapsing civilization, yes. Yes. Conflict. Exactly, so one of them was disunity within the political system was disintegrating. Yes. Corruption, yes, excellent, Ex yes, yeah. corruption in all the, particularly the ruling circles, but everywhere, yes. Yes, so the huge decline in, in moral standards in the Roman Empire, yes, absolutely. What was one of the other ones? Inordinate pursuit of material pleasures. Yeah. What's that called in Greek language? 
Hedonism, very good, hedonism, yes. Hedonism means the pursuit of material pleasure for its own good, right? I, I live for today, I have to have as much of a good time as possible today and I don't care about tomorrow, there's even a song for it, isn't there, pop song? Yes, and you know, <laughs> you know all about... <laughs> You know, all about the orgies and the, you know, the feasts that they would have, you know, they would Orgia. eat all night, they'd make themselves vomit so they could eat more, you know, and drink more and all these sports, too much attachment to sports at the Colosseum and watching the gladiators eating the Christians and, you know, just uh, not the gladiators, the lions eating the, sorry, <laughs> the lions eating, <laughs> eating the Christians and everything else, remember? And it was, they would queue up the night before to get the best tickets to get the best view. And they would go and, you know, be, have lots of vacation and holiday in the ruins of other civilizations. They say, yeah, yeah, this is never going to happen to us, of course, you know. <laughs> One of the other major, major signs of the declining civilization was increasing expenditure on armaments at the expense of everything else, at the expense of social welfare, for example. And because of that corruption, because of the greed, that the Romans had, there was increasing gap between the rich who were the Romans and the poor who were the slaves, as you said. So there was increasing disquiet among the people. Okay. The other sign was that of because they were spending more and more on armaments and on the Romans getting richer, right? There was increasing burden of taxation on the people. Where were they getting this money from? From the taxes that they were collecting very often unjustly from the citizens. Okay. And then because of that, because of this disquiet and disgruntlement, there were increasing rebellions, as you said, rebellions and disunity from all quarters of, the, of Rome that they were trying to quash by force. I'm very glad to see that some people are taking notes. It's very good. It helps you keep, uh, keep uh, more conscious. But also, if individuals want copies of this presentation, I would be delighted to share it with you, okay? And of course, as Socrates said, and he seems to be making one of some of the best remarks so far. The breakdown of the family unit, you'd better watch it. The breakdown of the family unit, the spread of immorality, divorce, sexually transmitted diseases, all of these things were signs of a civilization that was outwardly glorious and rich, but inwardly it was rotting. So the, the Romans would marry to get divorced and they would divorce to get mar married again, and there was no um, respect and no knowledge for the sacred tie of marriage. There was spread of all sorts of aberrations of human nature. And uh, as I said, the whole thing was just totally corrupt from within. Now, these were the outward signs and symptoms of what you could see and feel of a declining civilization. What was the basic illness of which, of which all were that we said were signs and symptoms? Because if you have a disease, right? There are some signs and symptoms that you feel because of a basic illness, right? So if you have meningitis, say, right? If you have meningitis, what, what symptoms do you get? Yes, neck stiffness. Yes, vomiting. A horrible rash that doesn't fade with your glass test. Headache. Fever. Convulsions. Uh, yes, all of these, all of these signs, and this sign would be like a rash and so on. Symptoms would be something you feel. Signs are what you see, right? And what is the basic illness that causes all of these many signs and symptoms in meningitis, say? A virus or a bacterium? It's a microorganism, right? Now, can you see the virus or the bacterium? Can you see it? No. When I ask a question, I expect everybody to say no or yes, you know, everybody all together in unison, in harmony, right? So can you see the bacterium? No. Can you feel the, ba oh, I can feel this meningococcus, you know. Can you feel it? No. The basic illness is invisible. It is in tangible. Thank you. Yes. And how many symptoms and diseases are, uh, symptoms and signs are there? Many, right? How many basic illnesses are there, say, in meningitis? Just the one. The one. There is one cause of disease and many, many, many symptoms and signs, okay? That's the same with many pathologies. And the cause of the, the um, role of the doctor is to see what the patient is feeling, 
right? Hear what he's feeling, seeing what he can see that's wrong, and to come to the diagnosis, which is one. And if the patient had, say, meningitis, if there was a NAF doctor, a bad doctor who didn't know, an unskilled doctor who didn't know what the cause was, what would he be doing? What would he be doing? He would be, at best, treating the symptoms. Thank you very much. He would be treating the symptoms if he didn't know what the basic cause was, right? And so, you're vomiting. Oh, you know, I'll give you some antiemetic to stop your sickness. You have fever. I'll give you... Uh, antipyretic, you know, paracetamol to stop the fever. You have a rash, I'll put some cream on your rash, get it better, right? You're seizing, you've got these creases, these seizures, I'll give you some anti-convulsant anti up your, sorry, but I'll give, you, I'll give you some anti-convulsant, okay? But that's a stupid doctor, it's a silly doctor, an unskilled doctor, okay? Because he was unable to put all these symptoms and signs together and to treat the most important thing, which is the basic illness, the meningococcal. So therefore, what happens to the patient if you give all those symptom relief and you don't, you don't give him the antibiotic? So his condition will deteriorate. He might just improve a little bit. You know, he feels a bit better if he's not fitting, if he hasn't got a headache, you've given him a painkiller, he will improve for a short while. But then, my goodness, the meningococci are proliferating at a very rapid rate. So then he will get worse and worse and worse. And then he is at risk of death, of course, eventually, and ir irreversible brain damage if he doesn't, Boy. if he survives. And it is exactly the same thing with civilization, with the whole uh, civilization of the world or any, uh, uh, any part of it, any single civilization. So what was the basic illness, the basic, the most important, the fundamental underlying cause for the fall of the Roman Empire, of which all those factors in the previous slides were just symptoms and signs of. Yes, absolutely, the loss of moral values and? Yes, exactly, absolutely, so all of those things. Basically, the Romans forgot who they were as true human beings, right? And they had lacked, they lacked those, as you said, moral values and true leadership that enabled them to flourish previously. Yes, absolutely. And that is exactly what Baha'u'llah says. He says, true loss is for him whose days have been spent in utter ignorance of his self. So basically, beyond all the apparent reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire, the main reason, the basic illness, was that the Romans had forgotten those essential spiritual or moral or human values that can alone create a healthy human being and therefore a healthy society. Would you agree? And look what happened. The Romans lost everything. This is what is left. So they became big losers. L for loser, loser. They lost everything. True loss, Baha'u'llah says, is for him whose days have been spent in utter ignorance of his self. Now, what were these values? the Roman values, we mentioned them already. Hedonism, no, they believed that there was no life after death, that this is all, they, were, they didn't believe in your metaphysic, that this is the life, right? Don't after care, life. nothing's coming afterwards. And therefore, they were not accountable for their actions in the next world. They believed in the division of the classes, Roman versus slave, very much so. They shunned the sick, the old, and the ugly, and they only believed in the perfect, physical teenage body, basically, the best, <laughs> the, at its best, right? The Romans believed in the exercise of war and in force and violence. And, of course, they had no value for marriage or family any longer. And at the same time, what was happening? At the same time as Rome was falling, what was happening? Uh, yes, Christianity was rising. Jesus came. Jesus appeared in a colony, in fact, the worst colony, what was considered at the time, it was right down in the dumps, <laughs> right? in the Holy Land at the time. Among the Jews who at that time had reached really unfortunately the depth of degradation, having been so great thousands of years earlier. And of course it was called the rebellion, right? The rebe uh, Jewish rebellion, a rebellion of the Nazarene sect. Christianity was considered just a sect of Judaism at the time, of really no consequence whatsoever. He preached for three years, he was crucified. They thought that that's the end of it, right? And Jesus, of course, challenged every single one of the Roman values. And interestingly, 
and contrary to the Roman expectations, Christianity was spreading this sect, as they called it, right? Jewish sect. It was spreading quickly and or throughout all the strata of society. I don't know if you can see this, this um, picture very well, but it is... Uh, do you know what story this illustrates? This was a, a memorial stone that I saw. It was in a grave uh, in... Actually, it wasn't a grave, but it was like a monument in Uzbekistan, in Samarkand. It's unbelievable, the most unlikely of places. I'm not sure if you can see the details very well. We actually later on need to make this a bit brighter. But basically, does anyone know what story this is illustrating from the Bible? Actually, it's, it, you know, there are others. It's not Martha, but it's which one? It's the Samaritan woman. It's the story of the Samaritan woman, which is very interesting because there were the Samaritans and the Jews, and the Jews were considered superior to the Samaritans, and they wouldn't talk to each other normally. And this was the well of Jacob. It was a very important well. And this woman came with her bucket to take some water from the well, and Jesus was sitting there. And Jesus started talking to her. And this woman was astounded because Jews usually did not speak to Samaritans. And then Jesus told her the whole story of her life. And she was amazed by his knowledge and affected by his spirit and his demeanor. So she asked him, who are you? Are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah? Are you the person that everybody's waiting? Who are you? And Jesus said, I am the one that, you've all been, uh, that everybody has been waiting for. He declared, as you say, his station to her. And he said... If you drink of this water from the well, you will thirst again and again. You will have to come every day to take of this water. But if you drink of the water that I give you, you shall never thirst again because it's the water of everlasting life. And these were the values that Christ was uh, advocating and teaching, which were, I'm sure you will agree, diametrically opposed to the Roman values and everything that they held to be true. So, Jesus taught, love thy neighbor as thyself. How different is that to, to, is this to what the Romans believed in, right? Amen. It's like saying today, you know, to the Jews and the Muslims, love each other as your neighbors, you know? <laughs> Would they actually? <laughs> or the black and the white, or the Shia and the, the Sunni and all these antagonistic people. So, Jesus taught that material good was not the only good. That there is an, we are accountable in the hereafter, that there is a life after death, and that we will be held very, very much accountable for our deeds in this life. Jesus taught people to look after the downtrodden, the sick, and the disabled. And Jesus renounced violence. He taught his followers to completely renounce violence, and he taught them that it would be better to get killed than to kill. And he taught them oneness and brotherhood. And he reestablished, reiterated the sacredness of marriage and family unit to such an extent that he actually forbade divorce. Okay, so this was, this was Jesus' uh, challenge and his, his actual his, uh, gift to humanity. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is the most important challenge, isn't it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is the life, you know, if you believe in me. He said, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. And he said that I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I have come that you have a better life both in this world and in the next world. But if you, if you follow these teachings, right, and, and um, have become conscious of your spiritual nature, right? So Jesus reminded people of the purpose, of this moral purpose of earthly life. And his revelation, of course, inspired the advances made in every realm. The Romans, of course, indirectly benefited from the appearance of Jesus and his revelation but they refused to submit to his will and to his teachings. They were fast asleep. Just as Baha'u'llah says today, he says the peoples of the world are fast asleep. And the Romans had become victims, victims of their own self and passions, right? Into which they sank in the end. And Baha'u'llah, of course, warns us in, the, in his writings and the gleanings that whoever doesn't follow the divine teachings will sink will become a victim of self and passion and in the end sink 
in their depths. It's a very powerful uh, metaphor. However, those who responded became a new people imbued with new wonderful values. And they developed new capacities, right? Christ conquered the Romans, in fact, and his light energized the creation of a new civilization which spread throughout the world. And we know in the year 330, Constantine, the Roman emperor, became a Christian, right? And he Christianized Europe, and he was generally a very good man. And we know that then Rome, by about five or 600 years, it was really collapsed. And I know about 500 years AD, the Academy of Athens was closed forever. And the Byzantium was born, born out of the, uh, uh, out of the uh, inspiration of Jesus' revelation. And these are the Roman ruins again, and the rise of the uh, Christian civilization throughout the world. Now, I think we will just uh, conclude, bring this to conclusion in the next two, three minutes. Are you okay still? Yes, in the next two, three minutes before we, wait, we break. So the conclusion we come to is that first of all, right? First of all, divine revelation is the motive power of civilization. In the case of the Greek civilization and therefore the Roman civilization, it was the Judaic dispensation. And for the different, for the different civilizations that we have seen in the world, different religions have been the motive power of their coming into being. So Baha'u'llah says, there can be no doubt whatever that the peoples of the world, of whatever race or religion, derive their inspiration from one heavenly source and are the subjects of one God. This is a very, very important passage, by the way, from the writings, one of Shoghi Effendi's and the House of Justice's most favorite quotes that I recommend everyone to learn. It's very effective and very deep and beautiful. So when we look at the history of humanity, we will find that every civilization has been energized and galvanized by the appearance of one of these educators of humanity, one of these divine physicians, one of these manifestations of God. So Abraham, Krishna, Moses, Zoroaster, Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, I don't think you need to translate those. So they all taught the same principle that is at the basis of any society that is functioning and therefore a society that is called a civilization. And that consists of putting into practice the golden rule. So treat others as you want to be treated is the basis of justice, of moderation, of balance, of an integrated person and society. And if you look at his history, if you consider the past, as Baha'u'llah tells us to do, right? If you consider our history, you will find that every system, every people, every society in which the golden rule has been put into practice, and so long as the golden rule has been put into practice, they have thrived and they have flourished. And as soon as they forget these principles, then they collapse. Invariably, if you show me a civilization that one, hasn't been energized by a manifestation of God, and two, who has thrived despite um, not putting into practice these rules, then let me know. But I'm sure I'll give you my email, but there's no point because there isn't one, right? And we recall that the manifestations of God have also been the source of all our moral values. So everything that we consider to be good and bad, funnily enough, we didn't think of ourselves, you know. They actually, all of these values, every single one of these emanate from the prophets. Okay, so we continue our discussion tomorrow. I have some pictures of the other civilizations to show you. We'll continue our discussion tomorrow. If you've got any questions, comments, we can discuss those later, okay? And then uh, I think it was very important to start with this vision of Shoghi Effendi on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which has many parallels to today, and then taking it to our age tomorrow. Thank you for your attention and for your patience.